welcome everybody to our panel today um, on the Holocaust in Greece. And we are really fortunate. I told my students this morning that we're, you know, it's one of the small silver linings of the COVID pandemic, which is that we can have scholars from all over the world join us right here uh, at, at Michigan State uh, pretty easily. So I thank you all for taking the time to join us today, um, but also I'm really thrilled with the opportunity that we have. And as I tell my students, um, so, so I should introduce myself first, which is that um, I'm Professor Amy Simon and I teach in the James Madison College, the Department of History, and I'm a core faculty member in the Serling Institute for Jewish History and Modern Israel. And the classes that I teach are all Holocaust related. Um, so I teach right now, I teach History 392, which is History of the Holocaust. And I teach other classes about Holocaust memory, uh, about trauma, narratives of trauma, about uh, Jewish history more broadly in Europe, uh, modern Jewish history. So all of my work has to do with the Holocaust in, in some way or another, but the Holocaust in Greece is in no way my specialty. So I am very excited to learn from these scholars um, about you know, their areas of expertise. And I think we're really fortunate to have them. And one of the reasons we are so fortunate to have them is that we have this amazing endowment, the Finifter Endowment uh, for Romania Jewry. Um, and so we have opportunities to bring scholars that talk about this particular part of the world, whether it's about the Holocaust or other aspects of, of Jewry in this region. And uh, so we thank the, the, the family that, uh, that endowed this fellowship or this, um, this you know, ability to do this and it, it covers all kinds of different programming. And today we get to experience it in the form of this panel. And I also wanna thank our other co-hosts uh, and they are in, they are mul multi, uh, multitudinous, they're in the chat, our other um, sponsors for this event. Um, and I will read them out, uh, the MSU College of Arts and Letters, James Madison College, um, College of Social Science, uh, Residential College in the Arts and Humanities, Office of Inclusion and Intercultural Initiatives, the History Department, and um, uh, the Peace and Justice Studies and the MSU Center for European, Russian, and Eurasian Studies. So thank you for all of these organizations for helping to make this possible and welcome to everybody from these units that is here today. Um, and I just want to say one more thing, which is that um, uh, we have a lot of Holocaust programming, especially in the spring as we move toward Yom HaShoah as well. And so on April 8th, we'll have our next Holocaust lecture, which is our annual Rabin Brill Endowed Holocaust lecture. And it will be April 8th, 1230 to 2 p.m. Again, another person from across the world in Europe speaking to us in the middle of the day, um, again, through kind of the wonders of Zoom. And this will be a lecture by Professor uh, Diana Dimitriou, who will speak on neighbors in difficult times, Jews and Gentiles in the borderlands of the Soviet Union and Romania during the Holocaust. So please join us also at that uh, uh, for that event. So all that said, I would like to move on to our panelists today, and I will do a very brief introduction. Um, I'll introduce all three, and then we can kind of move in order so that uh, I think that the, the sections will work together very nicely, all the different um, uh, speakers, so I will do, let them do that without uh, interruption. So, first we have uh, uh, P, uh, Dr. Leon Saltil, who holds a PhD in Contemporary Greek History from the University of Macedonia in Thessaloniki, and has received postdoctoral fellowships at the Graduate Institute of International and Development Studies in Geneva and the Aristotle University of Thessaloniki. His publications include The Holocaust in Thessaloniki, Reactions to the Anti-Jewish Persecution, 1942 to 43, and Do Not Forget Me, Three Jewish Mothers Write to Their Sons from the Ghetto of Thessaloniki, and also forthcoming in English uh, in 2021. And so he will be speaking on A City Against Its Citizens, Thessaloniki and the Jews. And our second speaker will be uh, Dr. Georges Antonio, who's assistant professor of Jewish studies in Aristotle University of Thessaloniki. He currently holds the chair of Jewish studies and is a member of European Holocaust Research Infrastructure and International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance. His current research interests include the study of contemporary anti-Semitism in Greece, data sets and demographics of Thess Thessaloniki Jewish community, survival and social networking and the commemoration of Holocaust in Greece. 
His most recent publication is Collective Victimhood and Social Prejudice, a post-Holocaust theory of anti-Semitism in a political psychology journal, uh, which was co-authored with, with Elias Dinas and Spiros Kosmidis. And he will be speaking on the topic of revisiting bystanders, rescuers, and collaborators, social distancing and social networks in Thessaloniki before and during the Holocaust. And our third speaker is um, Andrew Apostolo, who is the first historian to have written about Greek Christian collaboration during the Holocaust in Greece in an academic journal. He earned his DPhil from St. Anthony's Oxford for the exception of Salonika, Christi Greek Christian reactions to the Holocaust, which is forthcoming in a monograph. And he will be speaking on the third perspective on the Holocaust, non-Jews and the German murder of their Jewish neighbors. And so this said, I would like to invite uh, Professor Leon Saltiel to begin, and I look forward to learning from you all. Are we okay? Sorry for that. I I, I put the PowerPoint and it moved all the uh, the controls and I couldn't find the unmute button. So apologies for that. Now we're all set. It's the marvels of modern technology. Um, thank you so much. Very honored to be in this uh, panel with such a distinguished audience. Thank you, Professor Simon, for your kind introduction. Thank you, the Michigan State University and the Tree Studies Program and uh, the Fifter family for their endowment. It's a great honor and a pleasure to speak to you about the Holocaust in Greece and in particular in Thessaloniki, something that is not uh, very much part of the international uh, discussion around the Holocaust. So I'm very happy to be here. Um, Thessaloniki, uh, Greece's second biggest city, had been for centuries a major Jewish center, often dubbed the mother of Israel. When the German army entered the city in April 1941, as Greece lost the war, Thessaloniki counted about 50,000 Jews, approximately 20% of the population, still marking the city's character. The illustrious history came to an abrupt end with the Nazi deportations and the Holocaust, when more than 90% of Thessaloniki's Jews found a tragic death in the Nazi death camp of Auschwitz. These Jews were well integrated in the city life, so their plight affected all sectors of the Greek public administration and society. Although many Jews worked as independent professionals, a number of them were employed as civil servants in the local government. With a majority living in the center of Thessaloniki, the plight was known and could be felt by all citizens and institutions. When researching the Holocaust in greater detail, the roles of local decision-making and bureaucrats becomes key. It was often they, civil servants, government employees, city clerks, and uh, local administrators, and also mayors, heads of associations and unions who were entrusted with implementation of Nazi orders. Studying the issue of decision-making at the local level can answer many of the questions that are lost in broader approaches. This presentation will study the limits of complacency, complicity, and collaboration, a common theme related to the Holocaust, where the distinction is often unclear. Moreover, it can answer whether state institutions acted as a kind of protective screen against the persecution of the Jews by using, for example, bureaucratic tricks to delay the implementation of the Nazi orders. The municipality is an appropriate case study for several reasons. First, it counted the biggest number of Greek Jews in their jurisdiction, more than one fifth of the total population of the city. Second, the Jews were not isolated, but rather centrally located in a significant element of the city's life. Third, the members of the municipal council were important local personalities or prominent businessmen, being active in civil society organizations and connected to the national political figures, thus being part of the city's Greek Christian elite. The first mayor during this period was Konstantinos Mercurio. He studied Greek literature and worked as a, as a school teacher and later as director of a private school, 
He was appointed mayor in 1937 by the Metaxax dictatorship, and the Germans kept him in that position until February 1943. Yorgos Seremetis succeeded Mercurio as the second mayor after the first became sick. Seremetis was until that point a prominent lawyer and president of the Lawyers Association. Uh, six case studies will be briefly presented. The use of the city, uh, of, of the use by the city of Jewish slave labor, the renaming of the streets with Jewish names, the city's involvement with the destruction of the Jewish cemetery, the use by the city, oops, that's double, sorry, the replacing of the Jewish employees in the municipality of Thessaloniki, the acquisition of Jewish property, and recent developments and attitudes today. Um, the lives of the Jews of Thessaloniki changed irreversibly on Saturday, July 11, 1942, when under instructions from the local German army headquarters, all Jewish males were called to gather in Liberty Square, located in the city center. This event marked the first anti-Semitic measure where the, after the German army occupied Thessaloniki in April 1941. The Black Sabbath, as it became known, saw approximately 8,500 Jewish men aged 18 to 45 going through humiliating uh, gymnastics under a blistering sun. German soldiers beat those unlucky Jews who arrived late, smoked, or dared to sit down. The reason for this compulsory assembly was to mobilize them for forced labor, mainly for, the, for construction work overseen by the DOT organization. In the following weeks, until the end of August 1942, some 3,500 Jewish men were drafted and sent to different parts of Greece to build roads, railways, and airports, and work in mines. Most of these men had never been employed in heavy construction work, and they were far from qualified. Following these events, the city's finance division asked the municipal council whether it should continue paying the salaries of the city's Jewish employees, who had been drafted by the Germans for forced labor, and were thus unable to show up for work. The city's legal advisor opined that the city should continue to pay their salaries. However, as the law did not cover this case, a decision of the city council would be required. The members of the city council agreed that it was lawful to continue to pay the salaries of the Jewish municipal workers for as long as they were enlisted for forced labor by the occupying authorities. 230 of these Jews drafted for forced labor were given by the Germans to the Thessaloniki city authorities for use at the cleaning services. It seems that the Germans offered these workers to the municipality without the city authorities requesting them in the first place. Although it's unclear how these workers were treated one could argue that these 230 Jews were much better off engaged in cleaning tasks in their own city rather than being sent far away and working under inhumane conditions like the rest. The city council also agreed to keep on paying the salaries of its Jewish employees, even though they would not be able to come to work. While these facts may be true, yet the municipality of Thessaloniki did not protest the forced enlistment for house labor of its Jewish citizens at a time when it also benefited from the labor. In this way, its silence and collaboration may have been perceived as a disheartening sign by the city's Jews as they started to face the Nazi anti-Semitic policies. As uh, Jewish forced laborers were suffering under a regime of hard labor, a fear, poor nutrition, and the limited hygiene, the first deaths were reported and the relatives in the city demanded action by the, city, by the Jewish community officials. While the Jewish community was negotiating with the Germans their dismissal, the Thessaloniki municipal authorities, under German orders, proceeded with the removal of an important symbol of the city's Jewish character, its Jewish street names. In February 43, only a few days after the first anti-Semitic measures were announced to the Jewish community, a municipal committee submitted a first proposal for the renaming of the streets with Jewish names, 14 in total. Yom Tov Yakoel, the Jewish community's legal advisor and one of its leaders at the time lamented this decision of the city council and the only Jewish member of the municipal council resigned. On March 26, 1943, 10 days into the deportation of the city's Jews, the municipal council adopted the proposals of the committee and proceeded with the renaming of the street names. Some of the streets took the names of heroes of the Greek revolution against the Ottomans of 1821 or a famous novelist, Penelope Delta, who committed suicide the day the German army entered Athens. The German authorities may have gotten the hint and were unsatisfied with the proposal. With a document of March 16, 1943, forwarded to the city by the Governor General of Macedonia in mid-April 1943, they modified the streets named after individuals. 
They kept those of mountains, lakes, or rivers unchanged. The German occupation not only brought with it violence, fear, food shortages, and other challenges for the local population, but also changes on their everyday routine. Streets where people lived, worked, or went shopping were not called by that name anymore. The local residents needed to communicate the address change to their business partners, family, and friends. The issue was a topic for conversation at the coffee shop or during dinner. The changing of street names affect the daily lives of the ordinary, of the ordinary citizens in a very symbolic and at the same, same time very profound way, marking the total erasure of the Jews from the urban landscape. The renaming of the cities with uh, Jewish uh, names was driven by the need to erase the Jewish character of the city and obliterate its Jewish past. The available evidence points out an initiative of local Greek authorities, possibly called for by local anti-Semitic circles, without any German intervention, at least in the first phase. As far as the Jewish presence was concerned, it was more a local affair to try to minimize it and erase it when possible. Since the Thessaloniki had become Greek in 1912, certain elements of Greek political life were trying to Hellenize it and turn it into a pure Greek city. It will be very well said that the choice of Penelope Delta in Greek revolution heroes was an effort of passive resistance by elements of the Greek bureaucracy. Nevertheless, the Nazis were not pleased with the initial name selection and to be aware of the nuances, they must have relied on local expertise. This must explain uh, the long time this whole process took more than a year to be completed. In the latter phase, the Germans maintained the overall control and followed the process closely. The leadership of the Jewish community remained engaged in negotiations with the Germans to release the Jews from the forced labor works, and an agreement was found. The payment of a ransom of 2 billion drachmas and the flattening of the centuries old Jewish cemetery in the center of the city. The cemetery, with a size of 350,000 square meters, almost 86 acres, was nearly and nearly 500,000 graves was probably the largest Jewish necropolis in Europe. As the city was growing, this large plot of land right in the city center prohibited a plan of modern urban development. City designs after the big fire of 1917 envisioned the creation of the university campus on its surface. The Jewish community was resisting such efforts by arguing that in Jewish religion, cemeteries can never be removed. Following the agreement for the release of the laborers, a meeting took place at the city hall on December 3, 1942, chaired by a German officer, which brought together senior officials from the office of the Governor General of Macedonia, the municipality of Thessaloniki, and the Jewish community. Although Jewish community officials tried to buy more time, the destruction process of the vast Jewish necropolis began on December 6, 1942. 500 workers were tasked by the municipality with the city spending around 100 million drachmas for the destruction of the graves and the gathering of the materials in piles. During the months that followed, the municipality would request or serve as an intermediary for building materials from the demolished Jewish cemetery, such as bricks and marble stones for its different departments and supervised institutions, even for future needs. These institutions, including schools, clubs, and churches. For example, in the beginning of March, 1943, it was decided to gather 100,000 100, bricks for the needs of the municipality. Accordingly, the city council adopted the budget of 1 million drachmas to transport the materials. As these materials were coveted by many in the city, the municipality's technical services division warned, quote, there is already a need to immediately transport a quantity of bricks to the municipality's workshop before their supply is exhausted so that they can be collected by the various services of our division for necessities that might arise, end quote. The city gave the elementary school Ioannidis 50,000 bricks and 100 square meters of marble destined for the construction of toilets for the use of the children during using the soup kitchen. The sailing club also requested materials from the city council for the soup kitchen, um, for a soup kitchen pavilion had created to feed 250 poor children in February, 1942. Uh, for this structure, they had already received 30,000 bricks from the Jewish cemetery, and they still needed wooden tiles, presumably from the Jewish buildings demolished after the deportations. The municipal council approved this request. On May 15, 1943, the municipality decided to build a small chapel 
at the Christian Cemetery of Hagia Fotini, which was located nearby the old Jewish cemeteries. For its construction, marble from the old Jewish cemeteries being demolished was used. In the beginning of 1944, it requested additional marble, stones, and bricks necessary for the continuing work on the cemetery, a fence, buildings, courtyards, etc. This arrangement was beneficial for the municipality since, quote, the cemetery service believes that the municipality is going to profit several fold from the value of these useful and necessary materials charged only with the transport and processing of the marble and the other materials, end quote. The destruction of the Jewish cemetery and the role of the city, as well as the fate of its materials, is key in understanding the setting in which deportations of the Jewish community took place three months later. By initiating and playing a central role in such an anti-Semitic measure, the municipality not only failed to protect its Jewish citizens, but also demonstrated that they were a separate element in the city with a different fate from that of the Christian majority. As the Jews of the Saloniki were placed in ghettos and the first transportation uh, train left the city on March, 19, uh, March 15, 1943 to Auschwitz, the question emerged on what would happen with the Jewish civil servants who were unable to show up for work. On March 24, 1943, the Saloniki mayor, Yorgos Seremetis, wrote to the uh, general governor of the Saloniki regarding the Jewish uh, municipal employees and seek clarifications. On March 30, 1943, two weeks into the deportation of the Saloniki Jews, Governor Simonidis sent a uh, circular to all organizations of public law and several insurance funds and foundations of the Saloniki, some 21 recipients in total. Simonidis asked that all agencies should submit list of the departed Jews so that they can be replaced by Christians. Acting Mayor Pericles Garofalu responded on behalf of the municipality on June 30, 1943, attaching a list of 16 withdrawn Jews. Garofalu concluded that the municipal services were conducted normally and no new staff was required, especially after the detachment of more than 50 employees from Bulgarian occupied municipalities. In the meantime, in May 1943, the municipality proceeded with the dismissal of Jewish employees who were, quote, absent arbitrarily, end quote. After they were placed in the ghetto and unable to appear to work, they were put on normal or medical leave. When this leave expired, the city officials would fire them. The discussion above reveals how the municipality dealt with the absence and eventual deportation of its Jewish employees, targeted on grounds of their religious affiliation by an occupying force. From studying the available documentation, there were no efforts to stand up for, or at least express solidarity with, the Jewish staff members facing the colossal challenge. Rather, the language used by the city officials is called formal, removed, without any feeling of sympathy for the Jewish employees, their colleagues for many years. As the Jews were confined in ghettos and from March 15, 1943, deported to the death camps, their properties became the target of organized and unorganized plunder. The Greek collaborationist government, under German orders, set up an organization to manage Jewish properties, homes, businesses, merchandise, etc., and to appoint Greek Christian custodians. There were also several instances of plunder of the empty Jewish homes by the neighbors shortly after the Jews were removed from them. These events have marked the social and economic structures of the city until today. The Thessaloniki city authorities also eyed the vacated Jewish properties. For example, some municipal services used the locations of former Jewish stores and offices for their own needs. Furthermore, after the Jewish neighborhoods were vacated, the city would destroy them. Under German orders, the city demolished the Rezivardar complex as its houses had become, quote, sources for infections, dangerous for the health of the occupying army, end quote. The municipal neighborhood of Six had also similar fate. On April 6, 1943, it was vacated by Jewish inhabitants as they were being deported to Nazi-occupied Poland. In the following weeks, the area was guarded by a police unit until the dishes and furniture left behind by the former Jewish residents could be sorted out. Four additional guards were hired to stop the looting. The city council decided to take down its 52 buildings and sell the materials, the money of which could be used to settle all debts of the municipality. As with the case of the Jewish cemetery, the willingness of the city authorities to follow the Nazi occupying forces and the Greek collaborationist government on the issue of the Jewish properties made them accessories to this immoral act. 
when property and material interests become a priority over human lives, the path to isolation, dehumanization, and ghettoization, necessary persecutions to genocide is enabled. Let me now conclude this presentation. As the first Jews of the Saloniki were leaving their native city in cargo trains under inhumane conditions to an unknown destination, one could only speculate what fate they could have had there been more solidarity by the city authorities, the professional associations, and the wider public. In dealing with the situation, the city officials used innocent technical terms to describe the unprecedented developments. They chose to deal with the issues that arose in a rational and legalistic way. They did not employ stronger language, nor wish to cause any disturbance, obstacle, or protest. The Germans appear to be the ultimate decision makers. The Greek authorities had to run the affairs of the city with few resources and big challenges. Yet, these prominent individuals, comprising of the city, uh, the city council, turned a blind eye to the well-being of their Jewish constituency and did not make it on the list of their priorities. The German occupation, with its severe and inhumane policies, constituted a clear break from the previous period. At this time of crisis, with the breakdown of many norms, both communities, Greeks and Jews, put their community first, trying to solve their own issues, elevating their own interest as a priority. The city authorities, like the rest of the senior Greek leaders of the time, had their own priorities. In particular, they considered the Germans to be the lesser evil, in contrast to the communist threat of the partisans, or the Bulgarians, who had an open expansionist agenda with regard to the Saloniki and the wider region. The Germans used the Bulgarian card as a carrot and stick. They tolerated the Greek anti-Bulgarian propaganda efforts, but regularly threatened with expansion of the Bulgarian occupation zone. In this cost-effective way, they were able to maintain the cooperation of the local authorities in order to keep the peace in the city and also to serve the wider goals. Single Greek regional officials hoped to get the Germans on their side and advocate against any resistant actions against the Germans. A stance in support of the Jews would have definitely been such an action and thus was seriously discour uh, discouraged. Some of the Greek elites saw an opportunity to consolidate the Greek character of the city, which was still dominated to a large extent by the Jews. The destruction of the cemetery in the city center and the renaming of the streets with the Jewish names were important symbolic moves that would make the city unquestionably Greek. At the same time, others saw an opportunity to, to expand their economic base by profiteering and getting rid of Jewish competition. The awarding of Jewish businesses and homes, still full of merchandise, furniture and possessions, to thousands of Greeks on the eve of the deportations, reinforced the blind eye attitude of the authorities, the elites, and the ordinary bystanders. Yet, the past did not only mark those who lived at the time, but also who are alive today. On April 11, 2012, Triandafilos Mitafidis, an opposition member of, Thessaloniki, of the Thessaloniki City Council, in a highly symbolic move, removed the portraits of the two mayors who served during World War II from a wall in the city hall with a lineup of past mayors. In his accusation against the two, Mitafidis charged Mekuriu with responsibility for the destruction of the Jewish cemetery and Seremetis with removing the Jewish street names. This act caused many reactions in local society with several points of view and arguments being presented, ranging from history and memory to politics and education. The mayor of Thessaloniki, Yanis Gutaris, from 2011 to 2019, has also been keen to reconcile the city with its Jewish history. He has been a vocal voice on the issue, even wearing a yellow star on his lapel when he was taking the oath for his second term in office in protest to the neo-Nazi and Holocaust-denying Golden Dawn Party. When the monument was inaugurated on the grounds of the destroyed Jewish cemetery on November 9, 2014, Mayor Butari spoke for the first time of shame for this unjust and guilty silence. While coming short of an open apology, the mayor expressed shame for the actions of the Greek officials of the time, arguing that the Holocaust stole the future of the city. As the city leadership is slowly coming to terms with the city's turbulent and controversial past, that opens the way for regular citizens to be educated and informed. Here you see a march commemorating the deportation of the first train that happens annually. The, the process that has started to reconcile the citizens with the city's own history, including its Jewish past, is an extension and in extension with the Jewish community must continue. A Holocaust museum in the city is now being planned. While the dead can never return, at least the living can pledge to keep their memory alive and never repeat the mistakes of the past. 
I thank you so much. All right, thank you so much. Now let um, me move um, the PowerPoint. Okay. All right, excellent. And so we'll move on to our next speaker, Jorgios. Thank you so much. It's such a pleasure to be with you and uh, in this uh, wonderful event. May I just say how grateful I am for being transported even virtually to uh, I'm academically American uh, soil. It's a, it's a pri privilege and a joy. May I also just say that um, uh, Leon's work, uh, and not only Leon's work, Andrew's work and uh, Renat Molko's work have been groundbreaking and uh, eye-opening also within the academia, but also outside the academia, especially on discussing the, let's say, the, the myth of uh, the Christian solidarity uh, during the uh, German uh, deportations of, of the Jewish community of Thessaloniki. And this is an ongoing topic in the Greek public sphere. And this is actually the, uh, the hottest uh, debated topic right now in Thessaloniki about the meaning of the Holocaust in uh, in our uh, local society. So those discussions are very, very important. And this documentation is really uh, changing uh, how we, th we think about our past. And uh, my presentation goes along those lines, uh, actually, to be honest. Um, the initial project that I was invited to talk about, but this will not be the core of my talk, was a case study of local importance uh, that dealt about the gray zones of survival. It was about a, an oral history of a group of 55 Jews from Beria, a northern uh, Greek city of uh, maybe 50,000 people. They were rescued in a mountain village of Sikia by the local priest and his followers. That was a unique case, to be honest, and a very peculiar one, and um, a very complex one as well. And what really impressed me, since I did uh, quite a few interviews with some of the few survivors of that group, was the inability of those survivors to determine or distinguish between rescuers and enemies. So for them, uh, all uh, possible people who uh, kind of uh, appeared in their story of rescue had uh, actually both roles. Uh, the collaborators of Axis uh, of Germans who arrested them uh, actually were the ones who kind of rescued them at the very end of their uh, of the occupation. The locals who firstly rescued them actually were the ones who betrayed them at the end. So the memories of the survivors were very fragmented and contradictory. They couldn't even remember the uh, or agree on the dates of arrest uh, that, and the events that took place that were pivotal for their rescue. In reality, what we were dealing with was uh, that we were dealing with a self-censored uh, memory for quite a few decades about the village experience that kind of um, um, mirrored uh, the very contradictory experience of that era. And uh, at the very end, the survivors practically never tried to reward or keep ties with the villagers, except, of course, with the leading figure of the priest. So this is like an abstract of what I dealt with. but. Uh, uh, after I finished that uh, project uh, on that scale, I started asking more questions in, into that um, topic and trying to figure out uh, how to deal with it and what to make out of it, to be honest. So I tried to expand the research question of this uh, small story into actually what rescued uh, those uh, Jews of Veria. What was the, the main factor that contributed to the rescue? And in other words, I asked, uh, a basic question into Holocaust research, I think, if survival is random, and if not, what might explain it? And what uh, I think the case of uh, Sikia indicated was that um, a, a concept that is not uh, very commonly discussed among historians, the social capital, is, uh, it was very important in this case. The social capital, as we know from social science, is, is multidimensional. But in this project, uh, I tried to figure out what uh, aspects of social capital were the, the most important. And I 
think at first it was a very resilient social network led by the strong personality of the priest, but also the equally strong personalities of the Jewish leaders of the community. It was also an issue of social class. It's not a coincidence that the, it was the Jewish community leader of Veria who was the first to be rescued by the priest. And he orchestrated the rescue of the rest of the 11 families who were finally rescued in this village. It was also about wealth. They all had to pay, as we know from other cases of uh, survival among Europe, they all had to pay quite a few money for the living expenses and, uh, let's say, uh, for the risk expenses of the villas. And they also, at the very end, I think it had to do with the assimilation level or the specific group of individuals who was rescued uh, by those uh, local uh, villagers. So that was a very complex uh, case to unravel. And those comments, of course, by no means exclude uh, other factors that we know are very important about survival, which is randomness or AIDS, and uh, are very highly regarded as the most important factors of survival. And then I took that set of uh, factors and uh, questions into a much uh, larger scale project, discussing about the Saloniki and its survival uh, rates. Uh, I think. Uh, Thessaloniki is a very well-known uh, example of a very low survival rate. Most uh, of the literature indicates that it's uh, between 4 to 5 percent. This is the official number, at least. Out of which only 2 or 3 percent escaped deportation, since the rest were sur survived, but through the terrible camp, uh, death camp conditions. So this is the actual um, target group that I'm uh, really focusing to, the 2 or 3 percent that escaped deportations from Thessaloniki. And this is a map of the interwar and uh, wartime uh, Thessaloniki, indicating some, not all, of the Jewish neighborhoods and ghettos during uh, the wartime uh, region. You can see the high density in certain areas of the city of Jewish populations. We might need to come back to this map uh, later on. So um, a short note on, on sources, because they're very important. And this is uh, very important on how let's say uh, the internal discussion between archivists and historians can uh, benefit both. In Thessaloniki, we are very privileged to have a very gifted archivist, Aliki Aruch, who has uh, done uh, true miracles with the data that she, she has in the archives. And she has um, developed a series of databases with the rich uh, metadata. Right now, her leading database, if I may say so, it's about, uh, is uh, 35,000 uh, people. And uh, the rest of the 50,000 uh, uh, Jewish uh, members during the 1940s are probably most of them unidentified camp victims. But this database uh, has very important information uh, and metadata about the living address, the profession of uh, themselves or their parents, uh, in which schools, for example, they studied and more, or how they died, when and where or uh, how and when and where they survived. So this is an excellent, let's say, a resource for asking such questions. And then a little bit, a little bit more on the sources. Right now we are on uh, extensive research on the uh, municipal archives, specifically birth and uh, death registries. This is a very long and painful process because the numbers are vast and the COVID doesn't help. But right now we are in the long process of completing an all-inclusive database. So, uh, so uh, far we have retrieved about uh, 2,000 people information and uh, demographics. Again, living address, professions, their ancestors, birth names, cause of death, etc., etc. There is a serious methodological problem here. Female infants are mostly not registered, so this uh, this uh, group of population is not. Uh, documented uh, uh, well enough. Uh, uh, a third important but smaller uh, group of sources is educational institution archives. Again, this is a painful process because it's practically a door to door, to door a school to school process into digging into their archives. So far, we have um, retrieved about 3,000 names from various. Uh, uh, school uh, activists and institutions with the huge help of my students who practically do the research themselves. And this is a joint project with the Jewish Museum of Thessaloniki. 
So let's focus a little bit more on how what to do with all, all those uh, data. And uh, let's focus uh, specifically on the educational institutions. Uh, let me give you two examples. The example of the music school, the conservatory, and the Aristotle University, my university. They were both founded in the interwar period, uh, just uh, right after the Greek state annexed the Thessaloniki uh, into its territory. And as uh, Leon already mentioned, Thessaloniki was uh, by, by far a Jewish uh, city uh, to much more extent than being a Greek city at the time. So it was kind of an urgent issue for the Greek state to transform the city into a more European, more Greek, and a more modern uh, version of itself. And it used uh, those uh, educational institutions to achieve that aim. And practically, uh, it, it uh, introduced uh, those institutions to all communities of the city by hoping that by coexisting within those institutions, higher levels of assimilation would uh, appear and uh, certain uh, problems would uh, disappear. And uh, we can see that the Jewish community responded uh, uh, quite well to that challenge. About 800 Jewish students uh, attended those institutions. It was very uneven though, very few attended the university uh, courses and the schools, and quite a few hundreds attended the music school um, uh, projects and programs. By the way, I should stress that this is a very middle and upper class uh, choice. Uh, for the Jewish community. So, and you'll see more about that in, in a while. So this is more or less how it looks. Uh, if we uh, move our, uh, let's say, uh, point of view to the secondary education, and this is a project again with the Jewish Museum and the, quite a few of my students. And what we do right now is we go to the archives of the schools, retrieve the names and then, uh, put them on a digital map uh, within uh, the city in order to figure out, let's say, the geographies of uh, social distancing and social proximity with uh, their Christian classmates. That's a long and uh, I think important project, but it's uh, well underway. We have many things still to do on that front. And this is how it looks like the metadata of the school archives. We have personal information on which school they attended, whether they survived the, uh, the Holocaust uh, or not, uh, what was the profession of their father usually, names of uh, parents, and additional information like uh, the one uh, Leon mentioned. There is a very dry reference to, to the archives that uh, the specific student ceased attending in uh, March 43. Well, he should have had some quite important reasons for that. So a little bit more into uh, interpreting this uh, material and also data. The actual question we need to ask is, what does it mean to study among Christians for the Jewish uh, youth? And how important those social networks that uh, surely developed with the majority, the Christian majority, proved to be during the Holocaust uh, deportations. So if uh, this accumulation of uh, this individual social capital had anything to do with their survival uh, possibilities. And you can see on those graphs on the left, it's the graph of the participation of the Jewish population in the music school and how it declines over the interwar years. And on the right is the Christian participation of the same music school and how it develops over the years. So you can see the parallels, although you can also see the shift on, on the balance of, uh, uh, of power actually and participation on those educational institutions. A, a little bit more on the methodology. After we uh, classified and uh, retrieved all that information, metadata, we tried to make sense of that. So what we did is we consider extremely important the home address of each individual. I think uh, that's true for everywhere, but at Thessaloniki, in the world Thessaloniki, even more so for reasons I can explain later on. Address is a first-rate uh, indicator, in my opinion, of uh, the social and economic status of, the, of an individual. So we try to take this very seriously into understanding, uh, let's say, the profile of each individual. The methodological problem here is that uh, those populations uh, 
were in the in a process of constant relocations. So each family might uh, appear on three or four or five different uh, uh, living addresses. The second very important uh, element that we analyzed very carefully was the professional occupation. Again, we chose a scale from one to five, one being very poor and making a very poor, let's say, professional uh, occupations, and five uh, very, let's say, rich or upper class uh, uh, professions. And then we had another methodological problem here, the very broad category of merchants, what kinds of merchants, we, sometimes we don't know, quite often we don't know. And again, uh, women were specifically difficult to, let's say, understand because they were uh, usually registered as housekeepers, which is not true. Uh, many of them were actually in, working, but uh, we couldn't know more about that. So with those, uh, methodological choices in mind. We had a pretty, let's say, rough, but I think uh, indicative idea of uh, the status of the community on individual level. And this is how it looks like if we put all those uh, information on a statistical um, uh, software, how it looks like about the total sample of the community that we have some information for. This is how it looks like in terms of its social class uh, distribution. So you can see that uh, this is a graph that uh, pretty much it's uh, very close to what the literature uh, says that uh, the Jewish community was very poor on its uh, majority with a very strong middle class, and a very small but very important uh, upper class uh, within its uh, community. And this is how uh, the statistics kind of reaffirm this uh, literature example. And then we try to test that with the uh, music school, uh, let's say, sample. So uh, on the left, you see the same table of the total of, of the community, how the social class uh, is uh, distributed among uh, the all members of the community. On the right, you can see the members of the Jewish community who attended the music school. I think it's rather obvious that the music school uh, members of the Jewish school community are middle to upper class to a much greater extent than the, the total sample of the community. So that makes a huge difference in terms of uh, what to expect from them uh, uh, during the deportations. And again, then we tested those uh, information about social class and uh, with the probability of survival, thanks to, to to the database Ali Kiaru has in the, in the archive about uh, victims and survivors of the Holocaust. And you can see on that graph how the social class might influence your probability of survival in the total of the Jewish community of Thessaloniki, the sample of the 25,000 people that we have uh, data for. And you can see how, how it looks in the, just in the middle of that graph, which is the middle class, it's the merchants, and how it looks for the poor on the scale one uh, indication and how it looks for the upper class on scale five uh, indication. So this is the total of the community. And if you can compare, on the left is the music school um, probability of survival. Again, according to social class distribution, you have seen the right uh, graph. It was the previous one. Just for comparison, I'm bringing this over again. And you can see that even within the same, let's say, social class, even if more or less what we know about those individuals looks comparable at least, if you just had the opportunity to learn music with, uh, within this uh, music uh, school uh, uh, institution, your probability or possibility of survival uh, increased significantly. And I think this is a this is not, of course, a conclusion, but this is an indication for further research. Just a very few words on actual networks uh, with people involved, I mean, not just statistical analysis. One of the major cases and very well-known and documented cases, of course, the Auschwitz Orchestra. Within the Auschwitz Orchestra, the Greek musicians were a very important part of it. And especially those two individuals, Albert Menasse and Jacques Strunza, they were the leading figures. 
and practically all other Greek male and female members of the orchestra, about 10 people in, uh, in total, are connected very strongly with pre-war uh, family, personal ties with those two individuals. So what they did, they tried as hard as they could to include people who might have a, a chance to be accepted to the orchestra in order to rescue them. And they managed to rescue about 10 people with that uh, process. And those people, of course, were people that uh, very, were very close to them. So that's, a, that's an example of a network within Auschwitz. And uh, let's now see two examples of networks outside Auschwitz. The university network. Uh, this individual here is Dorina Segura. Dorina was a law student uh, during the Axis occupation. And uh, herself and her close uh, Jewish friend, uh, Maurice Altiel, were also classmates in the law school. They had a common uh, Gentile friend, Antonis Papadopoulos. Antonis Papadopoulos seems to have been uh, well connected and warned them that they shouldn't follow the deportation process and try to convince them to rescue them and to move them. Back. So, um, classmates were rescued by their classmate. And then um, Dorina and Maurice convinced Antonis Papadopoulos to return to Thessaloniki and rescue both of uh, those individuals' families. So overall, one person, one classmate in the university rescued nine uh, Jewish uh, uh, members of the community to all families. That's a very rare event. And he was never recognized as a writer of the nation for reasons that I haven't been able to figure out. And the third and the last network, obviously resistance is by far the most important uh, network for survival of uh, the Jewish community of Thessaloniki, in terms of quantity, I mean. And uh, I think this story of these two brothers uh, exemplifies that. Again, they were also students in the law school. Uh, Yaakov was one year older than Isaac, but also he was more inclined to join the resistance. He was more influenced uh, during his uh, university years to join the left-wing uh, resistance organization within the university, while Isaac was kind of quite indifferent on that front. That's all I know. I cannot be sure, but Isaac was uh, deported uh, and perished in the Holocaust. Jacob was rescued by fighting with the resistance uh, member up in the mountains. And when he returned, he had to write down uh, back to the community all the losses his uh, immediate family uh, had during the deportations and his brother is among these uh, those victims so i think that shows uh, how the resistance could be the game changer into a person's uh, chances of uh, being rescued or not i have finished my presentation i would like it though to share with you this uh, picture it's quite uh, well known within greek academia and the public sphere it's a very rare picture that uh, depicts the actual process of deportation. And you can see on the left uh, version of it with the yellow arrow, um, the column of uh, Jewish people being deported in one major avenue of the city. And on the more, let's say, close up uh, version on the right, you can see a line of Christians uh, waiting uh, one after the other to say a farewell maybe to see for the last time their neighbor, their friend, their classmate, we cannot be sure. But I think it, it's a, a very symbolic uh, picture of both the social proximity, but also social distance during the deportations. And it really highlights what I wanted to share with you today. So thank you so much for your attention and your patience. Thank you so much. Uh, let's move on to our final speaker, Andrew, and then we will open it up for Q&A and uh, please keep posting questions as you go along and I will, um, you know, read them out after and, and hopefully have a really fruitful discussion. All right, thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks for inviting me to participate in the FINIFTA panel on the Holocaust in Greece at the Serling Institute of Michigan State University. The panel is, of course, named after Ada Weintraub Finifter. She was a distinguished political scientist, and her maternal ancestors were from the Greek Jewish community of Yanina. I'm very sorry we cannot meet in person. 
Uh, what I'd like to do is, first of all, talk about the big changes that have happened in the historiography of the Holocaust to give us a framework for understanding what happened in Greece and then give a couple of examples. So the central question about the Holocaust in Greece was why was it so easy for the Germans to carry it out? Why was it that the Germans were able to face such little resistance? And as we've heard, there were roughly 50,000 Jews in Salonika on the eve of World War II. Um, by 1947, when the community had somehow reconstituted, there were roughly 2,000 left. The Germans themselves remarked upon the ease with which they got things done. Um, their war diary for the occupation zone of northern Greece that they had, which was centered on Salonika, remarked in March 40, 1943 that it was generally peaceful and referring to what they called the Juden Aktion, which means the deportation of the Jews, um, they said that it was calmly accepted by the population. So how was it that they managed to get this done with so little resistance and with such ease? Well, what we have to do to understand this is to look at the role of the local authorities and national authorities and of the populations who are neither Jewish nor German. And now, as you know, for many decades after the Holocaust, historians tended to focus on the perspectives of the German perpetrators, in particular on German policy, and on the perspective of the Jew Jewish victims. Now, those perspectives are extremely important. We need the German perspective because they designed and implemented the so-called final solution. And they did it in a way that would ensure that there would be no record of the Jews or of their torment. We need the Jewish perspective to save that experience of suffering, but also because as Omar Bartov has pointed out in his work, you will find instances and events in Jewish and other uh, testimonies of things that happened that are not in the archival record. So how do we put these local authorities, local populations, such as the Greek Christians of Salonika, back into history? Well, what's been happening in recent decades is that you've had in places like Poland, historians like Jan Gross, Jan Grabowski, Barbara Engelking, Thomas Friedel in France, Laurent Joly, um, looking at these populations and authorities from their own perspective. So what we're doing is we're not reducing them to simply how they reacted to what the Germans did or how they reacted to the Jews suffering. We're looking at them in terms of their own agendas and their own interests. Now, this process has started in Greece, I'm pleased to say. Um, it was neglected for many decades. That's because um, Greek society wasn't really interested in hearing about the suffering of the Jews. That's because people took at face value the excuses of the collaborator regimes, that they were weak and that they were administrations of emergency, and also because until relatively recently, it was convenient in Greece to emphasize um, the Jewish collaboration that occurred, which was relatively minimal, as a way of basically blaming the Jews for their own suffering. So this revolution in Holocaust studies has put these local authorities and local populations back into the foreground where they were during the war and where they were understood to be. So I'm gonna give you just a couple of examples um, so we can have a longer discussion. Um, let's look at the beginning of the German occupation of Greece in 1941 and at the deportations in 1943. Now, as you know, Greece entered World War II in October 1940 after an attack by Italy. Um, the Greeks defeated the Italian attack, but they were not in a position to fight a prolonged war. What happened was that a group of Greek generals, clerics and politicians decided that they would mutiny against the war and take Greece out. They weren't able to. Uh, before the Germans attacked on April the 6th, 1941. Now, what's interesting is that within three days, the German army had reached Salonika, where it received a friendly reception from the local authorities and some of the Greek Christian population. The Jews that day stayed indoors. The generals who had wanted to mutiny then took their chance. They sprang into action and they surrendered the armies in northern Greece to the Germans on April the 20th, 1941. And then on April the 26th, 1941, these traitors essentially um, created a collaborationist government under the leadership of a man called General Yorgos Tsolakoglu. Now, as I said, these administrations, the collaborator administrations tried after the war to portray themselves as somehow weak, somehow trying to save Greece, but actually they had their own agenda. And Tsolakoglu's agenda was very interesting. And he did three things in 1941 that undermined the position of Greek Jews. And what's interesting about these three things is that they were 
his own agenda, but only one of them actually related directly to the Jews. And again, this is how we have this new understanding of the Holocaust, seeing how the local factors, the local forces were pursuing their own interests. So the first thing he did was that he announced that Greece was now uh, the Greek state. He renamed the country and he said that the new state derived its legitimacy from the people and the will of the armed forces. Now that was a very significant development because Greece before had not been explicitly a military state. There had been military dictatorships in Greece, but it hadn't been a military state. And the backbone of this new state that he founded was the officer corps. And the problem with that for the Jews is that there were very few Jews in the officer corps. There were only a couple of hundred Jews were officers in the Greek army. Um, it was very hard for Jews to actually get anywhere in the Greek army. The second thing he did, which also undermined the Jews, was that he purged the pre-war Metaxas regime. Now, what's interesting about that is that he had an obvious political motive to purge the pre-war Metaxas regime. George Solakoglu was a traitor. He had betrayed his country. He had muted in against his legitimate government. He surrendered the army to the Germans. He needed to distract attention from his treason. Fair enough. But also, he understood that the Metax regi regime had not been particularly popular in Greece. So purging that regime was one way of perhaps building his own popularity. Now, that affected the Jews because although Metax, as I said, wasn't incredibly popular in Greece, he was a dictator, Metaxas had protected the Jews. He had certainly pressured them to continue to become more Greek in terms of speaking Greek rather than Judeo-Spanish. He'd certainly continued to try to marginalize them in the economy of Salonika, but he had stopped press and political anti-Semitism. He had not persecuted them and he had not targeted them. So taking away the Metaxas regime was a signal that a protection for the Jews was gone. The third thing that Solakoglu did was much more sinister. In September 1941, he gave an interview to a German newspaper in which he spoke about the existence of a so-called Jewish problem in Greece. Now, this was very significant because no Greek leader before had talked about the Jews as a Jewish problem. They had certainly been leaders who were hostile to the Jews, such as Venizelos in the interwar era, but nobody had actually used that kind of terminology. To make it worse, in that interview, Tolakoglu used the kind of anti-Semitic language that you would find in the writings of someone like uh, Theodor Fritsch, the famous German anti-Semite. He referred to Jews by religion and Jews by origin. So what he did in that interview was he communicated to the Germans that the future of Greek Jews was up for, was up for negotiation, but he also communicated that he himself was able to think and speak in the kind of anti-Semitic language that the Germans were using. So that's what happened in 1941. Now let's have a look at 1943, uh, the deportation of the Jews. So by 1943, Tolakoglu was gone. His government had failed. Um, his attempt to work with the Germans against the Bulgarians had to a degree succeeded. The Gul Bulgarians were not able to annex northeastern Greece. He was able to stop the Italians having any serious territorial ambitions and taking parts of Greece. Um, Tolakoglu had accepted the inevitability of German victory. But the Germans hadn't really, had not really helped him that much in the sense that Greece had gone through a tremendous famine, which killed around 300,000 people. There was hyperinflation and there was growing resistance in the countryside. So he was replaced as prime minister by a man called Konstantinos Logothetopoulos. Logothetopoulos was a distinguished gynecologist. Uh, what Logothetopoulos did was he knew about the forthcoming deportations of the Jews in 1943, but he did nothing. And again, it's interesting to ask why he did nothing, why he didn't resist. And the answer is that Logothetopoulos and his successor uh, were trying to pr protect themselves for the post-war era. So in December 1942, Logothetopoulos and his government were warned by a Greek Jewish official that anti-Semitism in Salonika, German persecution of the Jews was increasing and that this was a great concern. In late January 1943, the German diplomatic representative in Athens told Logothetopoulos that the Germans were going to deport the Jews of Salonika. This is an extraordinary thing that he did. He gave the Greek prime minister seven weeks warning of the deportations. Logothetopoulos in that conversation, and we only have the German account because many Greek documents have been deliberately destroyed. The account that he gave to the Germans from their understanding was there would be no difficulties from his side. 
And certainly over the next seven weeks, that happened. Um, the Greek authorities, as we've heard in Salonika, cooperated with the Germans. They facilitated the rounding up and deportation of the Jews. The police cooperated. The main administrator in northern Greece, Vasilis Simonides, cooperated. Seven weeks in which there were definitely no difficulties. What happened, however, was that there was a growing crisis in Greece. Um, as I said, there was the famine. There was also social unrest. Greeks were worried because there were rumors that the Germans were going to start constricting Greeks for war work. Um, there was also a growing re resistance movement in the countryside. It was relatively small, but it was growing. And the other thing about 1943 in Greece, which is interesting and a little strange perhaps, is that Greeks were incredibly optimistic. Greeks saw what was happening in the war. They saw the German defeat in North Africa in which the Greek army in exile very heroically participated. And people in Greece started to assume that 1943 would be the year when the British returned to Greece and liberated from, from the Germans. And so collaborators and resistors alike started changing their behavior in view of this impending German departure. So what happened was there was a, an upsurge of social unrest. And in early March 1943, there were violent demonstrations in Athens against the possibility of conscription for war work. And the Germans backed down on that. Later in March 1943, as the Jews were being rounded up and deported to their deaths in Auschwitz, um, there were letters of protest sent by the church and professional associations and others to Logothetopoulos and the collaborationist government. Now, Logothetopoulos's reaction is very interesting. He decided that he would send his own letters, even though he told the Germans there would be no difficulties, but his own letters were perfunctory. At no point in those letters, uh, in which he basically repeated what he'd been told by other people, did he actually say he was going to stop cooperating? Quite the contrary, he said he was willing to cooperate on anything that was legal. What's interesting is that at the time, people in Greece and outside Greece noticed what he was up to. Um, the Archbishop of Greece, uh, Damaskinos, sent Logothetopoulos a letter in which he said that, you know, one day, Prime Minister, you will be judged and you will be held to account. A very clear warning. Um, in July 1943, there was a intelligence report from the Greek government in exile, which said that you know, the Greek collaborationist government had done the minimum. They noticed the perfunctory nature of the intervention. Logothetopoulos then fell from power in April 1943, not because of the deportations of the Jews, but because of the, as I said, the social unrest and the growing disquiet about what the Germans were doing and the growing German violence in the Greek countryside against the Greek resistance. His successor in April 1943 was a man called Yannis Rallis. And here we come to, I think, one of the most interesting uh, events in the Holocaust in Greece that really illustrates how the local agenda was so important. Um, Rallis became prime minister on April the 7th, 1943. And within a couple of days, on April the 11th, he flew to Salonika to meet with local politicians. Now, when he was in Salonika, the chief rabbi, a man called Svi Hirsch Koretz, a very controversial character who was at the time working with the Germans, decided to meet with him. Now, Koretz had been told by the Germans he was not to intervene with the Greek authorities. And he'd been told by the Germans he was not to go near Greek politicians. Koretz had asked the Germans to suspend the deportations, and they, of course, had said no. Koretz nonetheless managed to meet with the Greek Prime Minister on April the 11th, 1943. The Greek Prime Minister was meeting with local politicians, and Koretz turned up and forced himself upon him. Now, we don't know too much about that meeting because no Greek document about it, contemporaneous document, survives. As I said, a lot of Greek archives have been destroyed. We have two accounts, contemporaneous accounts. They're both German. One is the German interrogation of Koretz. Koretz was a fluent German speaker, so it's likely the interrogation was carried out in German. Koretz said that he met the prime minister and the prime minister, what he said to him was evasive and unimportant. We also have a second German account of that meeting, that fateful meeting on April the 11th, 1943. That second German account is from a German diplomat, the German Consul General in Salonika, a man called Fritz Schoenberg. What Schoenberg did was he interviewed a Greek witness, somebody who was there and who saw the encounter between Koretz and Rallis, the Greek prime minister, and heard what was said. According to this Greek witness, um, 
Rallis was perturbed by the meeting. Clearly, it had an impact on him. Um, Koretz, who in his own account had said he cried when he saw the prime minister and begged him, um, Koretz clearly had an impact on the prime minister. But according to this Greek witness, the prime minister said there was nothing he could do. He could only make recommendations to the Germans. At that point in the meeting, the local Greek cleric, the bishop of, of Salonika, he's actually called a metropolitan man called Gennadios, took Koretz, took him away, and said, you can see the prime minister can do nothing about this. Now, what's interesting about that meeting was how the Germans reacted to it. After all, Rallis was their collaborator. When Rallis came to power, he issued a proclamation saying that he was going to fight communism, which is exactly what the Germans wanted to hear. He went to Salonika to work with the local politicians against what they saw as Bulgarian encroachment in their area. So why did the, how, how did the Germans react to this? I mean, after all, he was their collaborator and they picked him. The Germans' view was that the Greek collaborators were being duplicitous and they weren't completely wrong. Um, the German view was that essentially these people were trying to secure alibis for the post-war era. And I'll quote to you exactly what the Germans said about the meeting between Rallis and Koretz, brief and inconsequential though it was. According to Schoenberg, the German Consul General, he said, it was probably also a consideration for them, meaning the Greek collaborators, to secure for themselves an alibi for what is for them after all, a real possibility, the reappearance of the English in Salonika. Schoenberg, the German consul general who worked with the Greek collaborators was deeply cynical about their behavior. And he wasn't completely wrong because after that meeting, the Greek authorities continued to collaborate in the deportation of the Jews and the theft of their property. At the same time, the Greek authorities continue to do their best to help the Greek Christian population of Salonika and Northern Greece. So in conclusion, if you apply this new understanding of the Holocaust to the Greek collaborationist government, what you find is a government that actually, despite all the post-war excuses in each of the three Greek collaborationist prime ministers wrote a post-war memoir justifying themselves, these collaborationist governments were actually remarkably successful. They stopped the Bulgarian annexation of Northern Greece. They prevented any Italian annexation of parts of Western Greece. They worked with the Germans against the communist resistance. They founded an anti-communist militia. They started the process of expelling ethnic and religious minorities from Greece's border provinces. And in particular, they helped the Germans with the murder of the Greek Jews. This was a political price that in terms of their own political agenda, the collaborators were willing to pay. It was a price, of course, paid for in the life of Greek Jews. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. The thing that I hate about Zoom is that you don't get the like applause that you get in, in real life because uh, it's much deserved. I mean, these were absolutely fascinating topics uh, and, and papers. And I just appreciate so much the way that they spoke to each other, but also about different parts of the experience and from all these perspectives, the Jewish, the Greek, the Christian, you know, the political, the everyday, the municipalities, um, of course, showing us that, you know, there's no one history of the Holocaust and there's no one voice of the Holocaust and that, you know, we really have to look at all of these elements together to have any idea of, of what was happening and how complicated it was. Uh, so I have a bunch of questions, but I'm just going to pose one for now, because there are also some in the Q&A, and if we have time later, I can go back to some specific ones, but I wanted to pose an overarching one, uh, because you all brought it up, although it seems that, you know, what you presented was more about the, you know, behaviors at the time, and why people, you know, uh, participated, collaborated, didn't collaborate, and, and, and what was going on at the time, but you all also brought up, brought up the fact that your conversations are going on, not only in an academic discussion, but in a uh, broader discussion about memory in Greece and, and you know, perhaps Greek identity and the way that the Holocaust is, is being dealt with today. And, and actually my question will kind of combine with one of the questions from the Q&A, which is, you know, can you discuss how this, ha you know, why, you know, you each mentioned that it's, it's kind of changing and people are talking about this more and we have these examples of these figures that are paying very public attention uh, to what happened at Thessaloniki, but um, so why you think there's been a shift and a change to be more open to discussing 
but also how you do or do not see what's going on in Greece in terms of memory uh, in relation to what's going on in Poland, Lithuania, um, you know, where there's these similar history wars and these, you know, whitewashings of history. And then, you know, there we're seeing kind of a, a, a reversion perhaps to a more um, uh, unwillingness to, to talk about collaboration during the war. And so I wonder if you can talk about it also, you know, what happened in Greece, why it's changed, and then how you see it relating or not relating to some of these other national contexts. George, I think that has your name on it. Okay, I think that's an excellent uh, topic because it really brings uh, a lot of the topics that we're discussing to the discussion about the public sphere today, but also it's also at the same time about the academia because in a way both, uh, both fields feed uh, each other and influence each other. I think that uh, during the last uh, 10 years, we had a significant progress if I could be cynical, it has to do also about the huge improvement of uh, Greek-Israeli relations in the international level, which really uh, gave another perspective to Greek governments on how to think about this uh, Holocaust past. Uh, I think this, there is a line there that uh, connects those, uh, those issues. At the same time, I don't think we should really exaggerate on how positively the Greek society accept uh, those uh, developments, because the more visibility I think this topic gets, the more reactions also appear. You, you all know we had this Golden Dawn situation, which was obviously a, a very anti-Semitic, and uh, there were uh, Holocaust uh, deniers. And that, that are very, very popular views even today without the Golden Dawn party. And we have established uh, through a lot of surveys now, also with uh, Leon, we have worked together at least in three of them, that there is still uh, a huge issue with uh, contemporary anti-Semitism in Greece. So very positive things have happened, but I think uh, there is a huge gap between, uh, let's say, academia and a, a, a well-educated and informed uh, public sphere and the broader, uh, let's say, society, which is still maybe carries a lot of uh, misconceptions about the topic. No, the, the issue you, you brought up about a reversion, that's a very dangerous one about uh, Greece too, but I don't think we need to, you know, to get into a, a reversion mode that much because we haven't been where the rest of the Europe has been on the issue of the Holocaust memory so far. This is more or less what I think about it. Yeah, Andrew, please. Yeah, no, I think that's a very interesting point. The, uh, there's a fundamental issue here that a lot of European countries are facing. There's the problem of, first of all, national identity, okay, especially after the Cold War uh, and the collapse of the Cold War. And this is one of the issues that you've seen, for example, in Poland. I mean, when you look at the Holocaust in Greece, some of those who participated as collaborators didn't even speak Greek. I think this is Professor Antonio's work on, on the, some of the collaborators who were actually speaking Turkish. But what, does it, what makes you Greek? You know, what makes you Greek? Why is a Jewish cemetery not worth saving and not Greek enough, but every Byzantine church you have to build around it? What actually makes that Greek? What makes you Polish? Again, the same issue that we have in Poland at the moment. Um, what's interesting in Greece, of course, is that you have this post-war era of civil war, division, authoritarianism, suppression of history. And then you also have, I think, the particularity of the Holocaust in Greece. You know, 70% of Greek Jews were in Salonika. Um, very few Greek Jews were outside of Salonika. So you have this very interesting wartime experience in Greece where the Holocaust is a very localized event in Greece. It happens mostly in Salonika and in the towns and cities where Jews live. So it's not an event for many Greeks during the war. They have no experience of it. They have no knowledge of it. Morally, it's a central event. And, and getting those two things together is what Greek politicians have manifestly failed to do. But if you know anything about modern Greek history, it's all about avoiding the difficult questions. I mean, I can't tell you how many times when I was in Greece doing research, I would talk to people about some aspects of modern Greek history. Uh, for example, what happened in Cyprus and people wouldn't know the first thing about it. Um, and so as one person in Salonika wonderfully told me, uh, when you learn history in, a Greek, in Greek schools, it's pretty much lies. 
So I think, you know, there's a real contest going on in Greek history. And again, you talk to people in Salonika, what's really interesting is people, especially those with leftist backgrounds, will absolutely contest the official history of Salonika as given by the municipality. And that was what was so wonderful about uh, Boutaris, the mayor whose uh, picture uh, Leon Saltiel showed. I mean, this was a man who had conscience. This is a man who still has conscience. He's still around. He is a member of an ethnic minority. And he was willing to talk very frankly about the way in which I think the phrase he used, the city put its fingers in front of its eyes. So it couldn't see what had happened to the Jews. So. Uh, Greece, luckily, I'm, I'm pleased to say, has beaten off the Golden Dawn neo-Nazi threat. Greece remains a democracy. I know there's a lot of concerns. It hasn't gone the way of Poland and Hungary, but it, it really hasn't faced history yet. But thank you. That was a great question. I guess I can also jump in here and, and continue the, the, the train of thought of, of Yorgos and Andrew. I think, indeed, um, the reasons identified here for this resurgence of Jewish memory and the memory of the Holocaust in the last decade has to do, first of all, with the leadership of Mayor Gutaris, who used his position to indeed raise um, the topic, but it could have been helped by two uh, other developments. First is uh, the rapprochement between Greece and Israel, and second, it is the Greek financial crisis that most of you in this call will remember that brought sort of like golden dawn into parliament, a neo-Nazi party, and that also shook the perceptions of Greeks of their of their of their uh, of the present, and uh, many educated and, and uh, free-thinking uh, liberal Greeks saw this as uh, both the economic crisis and the rise of extremes as something deplorable. And by looking back into the history and into their into their trajectory of the Greek state, they saw how the Holocaust was a main point, a main stain in the reputation of of, of the Greek state and the nation, and that, that's why they sought to redress it. So all these things combined, I think caused for this for these developments and what Andrew was saying it's it's a it's a it's a very true you know in um, in many of these uh, documents uh, when people try to help the Jews and they lobby the Greek authorities the main point they make is that these Jews are Greek citizens and they have to be saved like they are there's a part of the Greek citizenry that's treated differently from the rest of the population uh, and the government has a responsibility to protect its citizens, no matter their religious affiliation. But somehow the Greek state uh, is, is a bit, um, what I say, guided by its millet mentality. Millet was the way of administrating of the Ottoman lands during the Ottoman Empire, where everybody was self-organized based on their religious affiliation. And somehow the Greek state seems in the period of the Second World War to operate like in the millet mentality. And, uh, and I think that's it's an issue that has come up in, uh, in research. And, uh, and that also relates to Greek identity and how Greeks identify themselves uh, uh, in, in that respect. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I'm going to kind of combine some of the questions with, with some of the things that you were just talking about. Some of the first questions we had as you know, Leon was first beginning and thinking about also the history uh, before the Second World War uh, of Jews in, in Salonika, um, you know, somebody asked what types of jobs did they do and how would you, and Professor Pauli, who is um, a professor of uh, Russia and East European history in our history department also asked, you know, how would you characterize Gentile Jewish relations in Thessaloniki prior to German occupation? And I also was thinking about this also in terms of like the form of anti-Semitism, the things you're talking about with Golden Dawn, that's very, uh, that's a very traditional kind of version of right-wing neo-Nazi, like using those old tropes. And I'm wondering, it didn't seem like that was a similar, that it was the same in Greece uh, before World War II, but maybe it was. So I'm kind of putting my question in with theirs to think about, you know, roles, Jewish roles in society, integration, and then the relationship between Jews and non-Jews before World War II. Okay, let me start because nobody else do, do, does. Okay, uh, very quickly, I think that's a, that's a very important uh, thing, especially for Thessaloniki. In 1913, the Thessaloniki is annexed to the Greek state and only after four years, the great fire takes place, which means that about 40,000 uh, Jews are uh, homeless and uh, jobless. So they're practically are becoming refugees within their own city. They live in the outskirts of the city, fed by the community, totally out of any social context and ties. 
And then just after five years after that event in 1922, about over on 100,000 of refugees from Asia Minor, Greek uh, Orthodox refugees arrive in the city. And those two populations have similar problems, actually. They fight for the same terrible jobs, the same terrible opportunities for housing. And they also tr try to achieve, let's say, acceptance by the Christian uh, majority that goes there. So there is a lot of, let's say, bottom-up anti-Semitism in local context in the Salonika at the same time. And it's very, very uh, uh, closely combined with, uh, let's say, a top-bottom anti-Semitism by the mainstream ideology of Venizelism, which was a modernizing force, but also modernizing in the sense that uh, any differences that uh, uh, the minorities and religious communities showed towards the majority should be addressed and kind of wiped out. So you have a pressure at the same time from bottom up and top bottom to the Jewish community to rapidly uh, become something that it wasn't yet, uh, Greek citizens with full, let's say, uh, Greek national identity. And because the sole question about language, language indeed was very, very pivotal in, in Thessaloniki because the vast majority was uh, speaking uh, uh, Judeo-Spanish and that was really uh, the main thing the Greek state education reforms were obsessed with, to break uh, the core of uh, Judeo-Spanish within the community and uh, move the, let's say, the majority of the community towards other language uh, choices. Very briefly on that. Yeah, so just, sorry, Leon, go ahead. Um, Thank you. I can I can just a little bit uh, continue, and then Andrew, you can you can follow. I um, it's indeed as 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 George said, there was the turbulent years of the interwar period. Um, at the same time, uh, the Metaxas dictatorship comes and bans a lot of the anti-Semitic uh, groups that existed in Greece, and somehow um, the Jews develop an illusion of of safety and that they are safe, and now they are safe in their in their in the country. Then the Second World War starts and the Jews enlist and fight in the army against the Italians in the same numbers, in the same uh, um, courage like the rest of the population. So you see that somehow in the time of, of crisis, in the time of war, the Greek Jews are there to fight in the front lines. However, again, this system breaks up after the occupation. Again, they go back into division. So it's, it's, it's what Yorgo said, I think the identity hasn't been fully developed yet and there is, based on the context, the, the alliances and the, the perception of the population changes. Uh, I think it's an important factor to, to stress. Thank you. I, I think I just want to make a point about the, the connection with Israel, which I, I personally find a little worrying. Um, one of the problems, I think, is the attitude of the Greek state here, um, that somehow um, the Greek Jews aren't really Greek and that Israel is a factor and actually Israel should not be a factor. And I think we saw this in this country in the United States where you had recently a president who talked about Jews as if they were foreigners. Um, and I know in my own uh, encounters with Greek officials, what's fascinating is that, you know, I remember once uh, a very high ranking Greek official came to me and said, you know, what, what do we do about anti-Semitism in Greece? And I said to him, why are you asking me? I'm not Greek, I'm not a citizen of your country. Well, why are you asking me? Why don't you talk to your own Jewish community? Why is it that Greece only seems to react to issues of anti-Semitism when it faces embarrassment from abroad? I mean, that's the great thing about David Harris of AJC. When that guy writes an op-ed criticizing them, they listen. But the Jewish community, they're only seen as useful in terms of maybe looking good when the Israeli prime minister turns up. Um, just in terms of the whole issue of, of Golden Dawn and the collaborators, um, there's been some very interesting work by a guy called Stratos Ordanaz about the collaborators in Greece and, and their post-war history. And, and post-war collaboration goes all the way into the Greek military junta that ran Greece from 1967 to 1974. Um, what's shocking about Golden Dawn is that they were explicitly you know, overtly neo-Nazis. I mean, these guys had Nazi tattoos all over them. Um, what's fascinating about the collaborators, though, as I, I mentioned this briefly in my talk, is that even the most gruesome pro-German collaborators are still trying to keep a door open towards the British. I mean, many of them were in touch with British intelligence during the war. They're, obviously, they were trying to play both sides so that they could hedge their bets. But even they 
were willing to actually consider a different alternative. And what's so gruesome about Golden Dawn and, and what's so shocking about them is that in a country where 300,000 people died in a famine caused by the German invasion, in a country that was basically essentially an allied country, a country thousands of Greeks died fighting for the allied cause, go to the Greek cemetery at El Alamein, there were people who were overtly German nationalists. I mean, really gruesome. And I think exploring that phenomenon, where it came from is, is a really interesting and difficult issue. And uh, the financial crisis certainly was part of it, but there's something really serious went wrong then. Thank God Greece has defeated them. Well, it's so interesting thinking about the ways, you know, now that we're 75 years out, the ways that things shift and change, right? That memories, get used in just so many different ways throughout time and I think it, it seems to speak to to that to some extent like this couldn't have happened in 1950 but here we are in 2000 or you know uh you know in the last few years um I do want to pose this other question because it already got brought up a little but um there's a second part to it about the language that was posed by another professor in the history department of uh, ancient Mediterranean history Noah Kay and um so he asked the question about um, you know, uh, about the case of Varia, and I understand that in Thessaloniki in the 30s, still in the Texas, educational reforms were targeting Jews who did not speak Greek, preferred to send their kids to French schools, et cetera. Et cetera. So the Varia community, were they, by contrast, Greek speakers, and so could more easily negotiate their way in a mountain village? So, you know, the, the, the position of language in these uh, social networks, I guess. Very briefly, um, I think it, it has to do a lot uh, with uh, uh, what that comment brought and it's very accurate. We also need to think of, uh, let's say, the language options that were quite a few. Uh, that was the French, the Greek, the Hebrew, and the Judeo Spanish, that were all options for, for the members of the community. And that's also very, very important uh, to be aware of that it's, uh, let's say, language option uh, maybe indicates other um, uh, identity, let's say, issues. Like uh, also class is very important to uh, choosing the language that you use, of course. And if that sense varia, middle and upper, uh, upper middle class uh, varia Jewish community was uh, much more, let's say, uh, speaking Greek to, to what's much more fluent to Greek than, uh, let's say, the equivalent in Thessaloniki somehow. So that was important. But uh, practically very, very near the mountain where resistance was already developed. So overall, it was much easier for, for a smaller city and the smaller Jewish population to flee uh, outside the city and uh, try to find uh, refuge in the mountains. Despite the fact that a lot of the, around uh, uh, the nearby villages really treated the, the Jewish uh, uh, population who tried to, to flee and hide uh, terribly. So this priest that I mentioned was the only exception that uh, tried to rescue population, despite of all the other factors we mentioned. But indeed, I think language is really, really crucial on that process. Professor Simon, let me also play a bit devil's advocate here, uh, because indeed the, the language and the, even the accent of the Jews of the Saloniki has been identified as a factor in, uh, in trying to explain these uh, great uh, numbers of loss. Uh, during the, the Holocaust. However, you have the case of Janina, where the Finister family, the Finister family that has endowed this uh, conference uh, hails from. And, and Janina was a Greek speaking community. A and their deportation and extermination also to more than 90%, very, very high numbers, happened a year after Salonika, when there was the resistance, when more people knew what happened to Salonika, they were close to Albania that was neutral, they were close to the mountains, so, and they were Greek speakers. So somehow, yes, it may try to explain Salonika, but up with, uh, with a lot of uh, asterisks and limitations as well. Thank you so much for that context. Um, and I, I mean, it gets back to this question of whether survival is somehow luck. We know that it's somehow luck. And then, you know, perhaps there are other uh, factors that we can bring in, um, you know, even within the camps too, right? The question of language played a role in what positions people could have. And that's a whole different conversation. But, you know, the question of Greek Jews in, the, in, the, in Auschwitz um, is, is also important, the roles they played there. Um, 
so I have another question that gets back to this question of the cemetery, um, also by uh, Professor Kay, um, about you know, it says um, you know the thinking about the gravestones. Um, and it, it showed, you know, Leon, that uh, the material was just as much what they were after as um, the space. And it sounds like they were quite desperate for the building materials. And he says, the sight of those gravestones piled up today in the courtyard of the rotunda certainly looks like evidence of symbolic violence. But was it, or was it, or was building with these materials just a, just immoral and callous, but not actually symbolic value, uh, violence? I think the, the case of the cemetery has many, many readings. Uh, first of all, the destruction of the Jewish cemetery is a local Greek initiative that's tolerated by the, the, by the Germans. And, uh, and it happens with the whole Jewish community present. It was before the deportations. So somehow you can even take it away from the Holocaust itself, if you mean the Holocaust extermination of the Jews. It happens. Uh, uh, before the, the SS even come to Thessaloniki to implement the so-called final solution. And, and to continue this, this question uh, of, uh, of uh, Noah Kay, um, is that not only did they destroy the cemetery, not only did they continue the destruction of the cemetery even after the war, but they built the university on top of it, where the Aristotle University, where Yorgos is, uh, is teaching, is built on the Jewish cemetery. And for me, that's the symbolic nature of it, where they build the, the institutions which are going to train the Greeks of the future on the land of the citizens that used to, let's say, run the city in the past. So for me, it's very symbolic that actually they didn't just destroy the cemetery, but they built the university there. It's not like a park or, I don't know, houses. It's, a, it's an educational facility which is supposed to teach people tolerance, peace, understanding, dialogue, respect, and it was built on the bones and skulls of my ancestors. So I think that's, that's why it has many, uh, many readings and a lot of symbolic uh, uh, elements there. This makes me think just a little bit, you know, a side note, and then I'll get to another question about, uh, you know, the use of the space in the middle of Berlin with the, with the, um, the, the uh, memorial to the murdered Jews of Europe, you know, choosing that space in the middle of you know the the capital of the country in order to you know uh, do a memorial project rather than building a university or something. It just reminds me of the same this like property value of a space and how uh, you know people that come after have to choose to to use the space and to um, uh, yeah figure out their history through it. Um, I'm have a uh, um, sorry, a question from Professor Aronoff, um, who, for those of you who don't know, is the director of the Surly Institute for Jewish Studies. And she says um, that we just screened the film, The Albanian Code, highlighting how Albanians rescued all Jews in Albania during World War II. Could you explain why there were no more rescues for Jews to flee to Albania? To what would you attribute the differences in terms of rescue in Albania and Greece? I think numbers is the most obvious question. The Albanian community was a very, very small community. And uh, the hard uh, thing uh, with uh, Greece is, uh, I think, the, the impossibility of generalization because we talked about Thessaloniki and for the right reasons, it was uh, the most important Jewish community by far. But if you look at other uh, communities, then it's a totally different situation in general and in specifically as well. So we cannot really say that uh, you know Greece is a, is a case that has uh, many common elements among its uh, Jewish communities. So it's very hard to compare, let's say, Greece as a whole with Albania the, as a whole because Greece is very very uh, diverse in that respect. I think, but maybe Andrew and Leon want to to contribute here. I think my, my experience shows the following George that it's very hard to make comparisons in Greece uh, in general in the Holocaust that every so every locality has its own time and space and, and local uh, uh, balances it's very hard to to explain that in a larger scale for example Albania was under Italian control smaller Jewish community uh, different institutions uh, Thessaloniki was under German control initially 
Uh, never I was under the Italian. So a lot of different things to be able to come actually with one typology and to explain things in that sense. Yeah, I think um, one of the points that I think Istvan Dirk made once about the Holocaust, one of the oddities, is that sometimes you, you in some places, collaborator regimes are more able um, to actually save their Jewish populations than others. So, you know, interestingly, one of the uh, great losses of Greek Jewish life was actually in France, where many Greek Jews had gone uh, into war and they were among the non-French Jews who were deported and killed. And actually, if you look at Laurent Jolie's book on uh, denunciations of Jews, you'll see multiple, you know, if you're familiar with the history of the Holocaust in Greece and, and, and familiar with the Judeo-Spanish communities of Southeast Europe, you see multiple names of people who are from these communities. Uh, and there was actually a roundup of Greek Jews in Paris in, I think it was November, 1942. But Vichy France uh, was able to prevent most Jews from being deported. Um, by contrast, in the Netherlands, um, there was, collaboration and a massive death rate. Uh, Romania was able to protect many of its Jews. Uh, in Bulgaria, however, there's very interesting work being done now by Nadej Regaru and others, showing that actually Bulgaria was gonna get rid of all of the Jews and there was no real rescue. It's just the course of the war changed. And as a result, they didn't deport the Bulgarian Jews. They, let, they deported the Jews from uh, their occupation zone of Yugoslavia and of Greece. Uh, and so I think in a sense, that's one of the things you find. I mean, same with Denmark. Right. Had the Danish deportations been scheduled earlier, it's quite possible that fewer Danish Jews would have survived. Um, but the fact that it happened so late. So the course of the war has a big impact. And personally, I'm quite wary of uh, these attempts by various countries to say, oh, look, you know, we, we save lots of Jews. Um, you know, there's an old, rather bitter post-war Jewish joke that if uh, the country in question had saved so many Jews, they probably would have had to import some of them. Um, and so there's, it's really not an Olympic contest between uh, various countries. I mean, you know, you also have to compare as well um, what these various countries did to the non-Jewish populations. And there's been some very interesting research. I think if you look at Italy um, about the way, again, there's this slight myth. I think Jonathan Steinberg had this in his book on Italians and the Holocaust, how Italian, Italy behaved terribly decently. But then you look at what Italy did in its occupation zone in Greece and the horrific atrocities against Greek civilians, and in particular at the concentration camp in Larissa, and you get a slightly different uh, perspective. Thank you so much. Um, I have a question now from the brother of Dr. Ada Finifter, Finifter uh, and uh, he says, concerning the Greek speaking Jews of Yananana, do you know if their spoken Greek was less learned than that of more educated Greeks, included some Hebrew words or expressions, et cetera, therefore enabled them to be identified as Jews. I can quickly say something on that, which is that um, what's interesting about the Greek Jewish community of Yanina is that they always spoke Greek. We have no uh, history of them not speaking Greek. Uh, and in, uh, if you look at their medieval uh, production and stuff like Mas or Romania, uh, the, the um, prayer, the, or rather the declaration for the new month for Rosh Chodesh is, is actually done in Greek. Um, it's written in Hebrew characters, so they're always speaking Greek. What's interesting is if you look historically at the surrounding Greek Orthodox by religion population, they're not speaking Greek in the early modern era, they're speaking dialects of Albanian. So again, my question, who are the Greeks here? The ones who have always been speaking Greek? or the people who speak dialects of Albanian and but are Greek Orthodox by religion. I think that goes to another issue, which is um, the role in the attitude to minorities and in particular to Jews in Greece of Greek Orthodoxy, not just as a religion, because Greek Orthodoxy is more than a religion, also as a culture. And in that sense, I would say, uh, if you look at this from a West European perspective, you can be misled. Greek Orthodoxy is not like Catholicism. It's more like Judaism and Islam. It's a very much a, a very large identity that encompasses you. And again, look at the history of early 19th century uh, Yanina. You'll find that the Suliots, who are Albanian speaking Greek Orthodox Muslims, uh, sorry, Gr Albanian speaking Greek Orthodox Christians are fighting against the uh, Muslim ruler uh, uh, of Yanina, Ali Pasha of Yanina. And of course, uh, what's he using in his administration? He's using Greek. Uh, just to continue a little bit, I, I'm not aware of any particularities in the Greek that the Jews of Yana would speak. 
uh, I never heard of any words that would give uh, that could betray their Jewish uh, uh, origins or background. What I know though is that they all lived in a neighborhood which was sort of like the Jewish area, and I think that was one of the reasons that made the roundup easier uh, because they all lived in the same area, or possibly around the synagogue. But I haven't done a lot of research on Yana to be able to give you to speak with uh, with certainty about. Uh, the elements that played the role in Yanina for the deportation of the Jews. Thank you very much. Um, and I have another question, and I, I'm not sure how to pronounce this as well, but um, this is from uh, Professor Emeritus Ken Walter, who says, um, I don't know if it's Jacko or Yako, Maestro was a young Salonican Jew who was sent to Auschwitz in 1943 with others. What is his standing in the current renewed attention to the Salonican Jew? My regards to Professor Walter, which I had met in a conference a few years ago, um, um, and we discussed many of the things uh, today. I, I know uh, um, Zach Maestro, and, uh, and the thing is that through this resurgence of Holocaust memory in Thessaloniki, a lot of the stories of the survivors come back into the mainstream. So you see and you hear, of course, unfortunately, not many of them uh, are, are around to tell the stories, but the ones who are around are often asked by the media to speak. I was on an in interview on the radio uh, this past Friday. There was another survivor who narrated her story live on the radio. A child survivor, and a lot of the books and the testimonies and the memoirs of survivors are published and republished uh, in Greece. And uh, Yorgos is also head of uh, is uh, editor of a series of, of uh, in, a, in a major Greek uh, publishing house that publishes many of these uh, testimonies. So um, as we speak here about the larger context, a lot of the work is also done on the particular trajectories of people and particular stories of individuals. All right, thank you. Um, so we have another question that brings us back to the question of, um, actually, Ken has another question, which is about renewed attention to the heroism among Salonican Jews. Is that something else that you can speak to? A brief I, comment, I, but, sorry, sorry, long, just, uh, just uh, one second. A very brief comment, uh, a bit off topic. I think uh, that also answers one of the other questions about the uh, current debates. I think mostly the discussion takes place about what happened in Thessaloniki and what the uh, Christian's uh, uh, position uh, was. And less to, we haven't really moved the discussion to what happened in Auschwitz yet. Uh, we have discussed this uh, a, a little bit uh, through various works, but not, uh, let's say, publicly. So the discussion right now, as I see it, it's mostly about, uh, let's say, the local uh, dimension. So Jewish heroism now appears as part of the Greek resistance. And it's a, a new monograph just appeared by the Asunas Handrinos, which is interesting. Uh, that, that being said, we really haven't discussed yet about what re really was the resistance about the Jewish uh, Jewish populations, so what was their, let's say, the limits of the solidarity of the resistance. So that's one of the discussions that haven't been really done yet. But uh, let's say any part of uh, the Jewish heroism within the resistance, we now start uh, learning more about it. Yeah, can I also um, just say that the important thing to remember here is that, as I said, it's the localization of the Holocaust. So, you know, Athens is the capital of Greece. There's 1.2 million people there that there's only around a quarter of a million in Salonika. And Athens is incredibly different during World War II. You know, when the Germans arrived in Salonika, the mayor's there to greet them, the, you know, the local bishop meet, greets them, the, the non-Jewish population uh, greets them. When the Germans turn up in Athens, there's nobody there to meet them. Interestingly, the Metaxas era officials leave. Um, they don't want to have anything to do with the Germans and the Germans consistently complain about the hostility of Athenians. They even, it's sort of gruesomely funny, uh, charged, uh, complained that their Italian allies are being overcharged in shops by Greeks. 
uh, a nice little bit of resistance there from the local population. Uh, and, you know, there's an attack on German collaborators at one point, and the Germans are very angry about this. But if you look at what happens in Salonika, by contrast, it's seen as a model of cooperation. So there's, there's a huge contrast there. And you, you have to remember, Greece has collapsed as a state. It's under three different foreign occupiers. Um, the cities are under the control of the collaborators. Uh, and by 1943, the countryside is being fought over by the Germans, the Italians, the Bulgarians, and the various resistance groups who are of course fighting each other because everybody's waiting for the, the Greeks at least, are waiting for the British to come back and they want to be ready for that. So, um, you know, Jews did have some opportunity to participate in the resistance, but it was very difficult, very difficult indeed. Uh, and especially, as I said, as 70% of Jews lived in Salonika. I think this is an important point, and uh, I, I said in my in my book that the, 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 the civil society in Athens and the institutions in Athens did more to save the Jews of Salonika than the institutions of Salonika. So I think that's also an important factor to, to see as we discuss here. Um, answering the question of the heroism, I mentioned initially uh, the fact that the Greek uh, Jews fought in the war against the um, the um, the Italians with great patriotism, and of course, Yorgos and I uh, referred to the, the resistance. At the same time, the heroism is used by the Jewish community as a way, after the war, as a way of seeking acceptance, that we fought and shed blood to the same uh, levels like the rest of the population. So it's also something that's it's been repeated and highlighted by the Jewish community early on, from the immediate post-war post -war years, as, as a proof of their patriotism to the motherland. Thank you. Um, so we had another question to go back to the a question about the cemetery. And I think we just have a couple questions left on here, which should time out nicely, um, which is, are there, does the university, uh, Aristotle University have any uh, commemorations to the cemetery upon which it was built? Very quickly, um, we have uh, established a monument in 2015, thanks to the Jewish community, who I think paid for it, to be honest and um, the efforts of the rector of the university. If this wasn't a recorded meeting, I would have said many more interesting things on how things developed and the internal debates on that monument, but I shall uh, uh, restrain from that. Okay, maybe next time. And I showed a picture in my presentation of this inauguration, and it's also important to note that George is a professor of endowed the chair of Jewish studies at the university, which also emerged out of uh, reconciliation between the Jewish community and the university, and uh, and is teaching now uh, hundreds of, of students every every semester about all these exact topics. And that actually feeds very nicely into our final question again from uh, Noah Kay. Um, and so he says, on the contemporary Greek confrontation with this ugly past, these presentations confirm my impression that we have a long way to go. On the other hand, there's George's students building their databases. And what about the municipality? Is it fair to say, Leon, that the municipality in Thessaloniki stepped up even before Mayo Mutaris to recognize their role? They were out in front of the Greek state and public, right? And also, I, I'm also interested in that question about the students and this kind of moving forward with the younger generation. I'll add that to it. Uh, let me take the first um, effort in this question. Um, indeed, um, the city under Butaris was a leader in, uh, in bringing out the, the Jewish past. The new mayor continues this path. Um, and uh, they're also uh, leading now this uh, effort of building a Holocaust Museum of the Saloniki that I also mentioned at the end of my speech. Now, building the Holocaust Museum, if you read the press coverage, it's, not, it's mostly now speaking about the bricks and the mortar and the land. The discussion hasn't actually moved to what is going to be inside that museum. So a lot of the things that we discussed here uh, in this, in this uh, uh, discussion haven't yet made it to the context of the museum itself. So that would be, I think, another round of, a, of actually multiple rounds of discussions in the city and beyond of what to include, how to frame the different questions, how to uh, explain all these actors who are acting during that period. And, and we have our own narrative here, but there are many outside of this circle who have their own uh, narrative and see things differently. 
uh, and uh, many of these things I think are going to be, uh, these confrontations are going to be coming up when we actually discuss what is going to be part of the exhibition of the new Holocaust Museum. Very brief comment. Sorry, Andrew. Go ahead, Andrew. No, 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 you first. OK. Uh, I must say, I like where we are right now, not because we have, uh, you know, really reached uh, somewhere, but because right now there's a very open debate and very honest debate in the public uh, sphere. And this is really, really important. It's much more important than establishing a series of anniversaries or of uh, ceremonies or official, let's say, dates that makes no sense for nobody. So right now, I think it's a very hot uh, topic and uh, very rightly so. And this is the most honest, let's say, uh, part of this process that uh, we will ever be. And I like where we are now because it really makes us uh, uh, ask the right questions and get the answers that we're not expecting to, to get. So let's see how things develop. But... No, I think that's an excellent point because you know, for all of us who do any research or writing on the Holocaust, I think the big question we have to ask ourselves actually is why is it that despite all these commemorations and all this research and all these museums, um, that first of all, we still have Holocaust survivors living in tremendous poverty, which I, I think is just shameful. Um, and why is it that despite all this education and all these public statements, we've had this upsurge in Holocaust denial in recent years. And, you know, the question is, have we failed? And I think exactly as uh, Professor Antonio just said, what you really need is a debate rather than the state telling you, here's a museum, here's an event, here's something you need to pay attention to. And I think what's interesting is, remember, Greece was completely transformed after the war. I mean, Athens went from a you know, quaint city of 1.2 million people to a concrete jungle of over 4 million people. Salonika has nearly close to a million people, including its suburbs. It's been totally transformed. People moved in from the countryside people genuinely do not know the history of their own city. It's not their fault, they haven't been taught. And so if you engage them in a conversation about the history, not just of their city and the Jews, but also of their country and what it means to be who they are within that European and democratic context, I think that's how you communicate this. And um, I think, you know, one thing to bear in mind is there were people in, in wartime Greece who weren't collaborators. I remember asking this, of C.M. Woodhouse, who's an incredibly courageous young British officer in wartime Greece. And after talking to him, I said, well, look, it sounds like there were some really sinister people in wartime Greece, and there were. But he said to me, remember, there were some very decent people. And we need to somehow put those stories of the decent people and of the collaborators together so that people get a, a more kind of a subtle understanding of their own country. But this is not just a matter for Greece, of course. This is what America's going through at the moment as well. Thank you so much. I think that's actually a perfect way to end, you know, thinking about the future, thinking about how to have these conversations, thinking about the fact that they don't only have to do with the Holocaust and we all, you know, every country has its history, difficult, complicated history, which of course, as historians, is our job to bring out not only, you know, in terms of publishing books and having these amazing conversations together, but bringing to our students in, in the classroom. Uh, so thank you so much for helping us think through these ideas about the Holocaust in Greece today. And it's just been such a pleasure having you here. And uh, yeah, thank you for all who asked questions and attended. And, and I know we all learned a lot. Thank you.